Fusion welds with 6061 aluminum will crack. Why did you do that on the inside? Hi Joey, thanks for the question. This will make a good video topic. So he's referring to an old video I made several years ago where I made a throttle body adapter for a V8 car. And the base plates were 6061, and he is, I'm guessing he assumed that this was also a 6061 sheet that I was using, but it's 5052. So I'd weld the outside all nice and pretty. And then on the inside, I would just run a, they call them, some people call them fusion welds, where you don't run filler rod, just to smooth that out, and then blend in the corners. You can fusion weld 5052 to 6061. It works for a lot of applications. And then on a part like this, all the structural welding is on the outside, so even if it were to have a little hairline crack on the inside, it wouldn't matter. It's just there to smooth out the transition between the two pieces. Hopefully that makes sense. This is quarter inch 6061 flat bar and this is 5052 sheet. The way I stacked the 5052 over the 6061, the 5052 acts as its own filler rod, I guess you could say, for lack of a better term. But there's no cracks in it, and it's really pretty and shiny. And this type of weld, you can see it, obviously it's not fused the whole way through, but this type of weld is plenty strong for a lot of applications. Just make sure your parts are fit up really good, nice and tight and touching the whole way across or else you'll have spots that look irregular. And do a little bend test to see how strong it is. I'm hitting on it pretty hard. No cracks in it yet. Okay, that held up even better than I thought it would. And you can do lap welds too without filler rod. This is actually really good practice if you're having problems with making your lap welds look nice and consistent with filler rod. This helps you isolate the problem and a lot of times it's where you're pointing your torch. So try to pay attention to how how much of this top piece I'm actually burning, I'm burning back. I don't stay out here, I, I come way back over on it so it acts as the filler. We'll see if this mark will stay here where it first starts out. I probably won't Let's scratch it. This one I'll do without the pulser turned on. Then you gotta make sure it's touching, see how that's gapping up at the end. See how far I am back over the top piece? I'm melting it all the way back to here. If you ever want to win a bet with one of your welding buddies, do a weld like this and ask him if he used filler rod or not. To the untrained eye, you would for sure think that that's got filler rod on it as high as it's humped up, right?
can see how far to the left the whole weld bead is in relation to where we started. Okay, I'm sure this one will hold this lap weld if I try to peel it over that way. So we're gonna peel it back off of it and see how that does. Starting to give way. But yeah, like I said, that would be plenty strong for quite a few applications. So this is same thing, this is quarter inch 6061 and this is eighth inch 5052 with no filler rod. Just depends on which way your force is acting on it. But trying to weld 6061 to 6061 without rod, it will crack, so I would never do that. You always want to add fill or rod. If you're putting parts together, you can usually get away with tack welding them, and it'll be, it's a really weak tack, but that's good enough, you know, if you have your hands are tied up holding the part and you can't grab fill or rod. But here, watch, we'll, we'll try to run a bead down this and watch how it cracks right behind. Especially with thicker metal because it's got such high thermal conductivity where your little hot weld puddle is, the rest of the metal wants to pull that away and cool it real quick. And that's also why you want to preheat thicker parts when you're welding them. See that crack running down it. So if any of you guys are wanting to get into doing some like repair weld work, if you come across something like this, you wanna you wanna bevel it out with the die grinder and get all that crack gone and then fill it back in. And for this type of work, aluminum removal, I like these little carbide burrs with the wide flute spacing. I'll put a link in the description below and not these ones. These ones work great for steel and stainless steel. But for aluminum, they clog up too quick. They heat up and clog up. And you can get the, you can get these to work, but yeah, you gotta put coolant in them, like WD-40 or some lubricating fluid. But then you, you end up packing that into your material that you wanna weld. So doing this type of stuff, if possible, I like to do it dry. And then put this in your shank as far as you can. The further it is out, the more it's gonna have leverage against you and chatter around. So if you're not needing to get in a really tight space, put it down almost as far in as you can. Snug it up. Go out a little bit. And then since this one has less flutes, it's more likely to jump around on you. So I typically use my bigger die grinder that has a little more mass, so that helps keep it stable. It looks like a weld, like a stick weld bead. And then like almost everything else, it always depends on what you're doing, what you're trying to achieve. So there's several ways to do this. You can grind through about halfway like I did, run one or two passes, whatever you need to get this capped up higher, flip it over and then grind back into your weld, open this backside up and weld it. 
or if you're not needing it super strong you can just weld in here and call it good and just have a gap back here like i said it depends on what you're building i'll put a couple tacks on the back side first because if you weld this it's going to want to curl in and bow up then when I'm doing parts like this, I typically don't know exactly how much amperage I'm going to need. So I just set my welder up around 200 and 250 for this type of stuff and then just use the variable amperage TIG button that I sell to vary the amperage to whatever I need it to be. And the reason I like using this over a foot pedal almost all the time is because I don't like kicking around a pedal everywhere. This is always just right there at your fingertip ready to go, no moving parts. Link for that's in the description below too. And then a lot of times when I'm welding at a table, you'll see me throw my heavy block up on something. That's just to hold it still so it's not moving around while I'm trying to weld, just to keep it in place better. And then another trick or tip you can do is add a little bit of filler rod here at the end of your weld while the part's still cool. So it's easier to tie into and you don't end up burning out the end of your part and washing it out. That gives you a little dam to run into. And then for this one, I'm just gonna try a single pass with some eighth inch rod. Then like I said, if you wanna get a full penetration weld, you can grind this back side out and do the same thing on the back side and then flap disc them flush if you need to. Little crack right there at the end starting. Okay, that one's for all you full penetration freaks out there. Depends on what you're building you. A lot of times you don't even need full penetration. Sorry for the background noise, we're putting in a sidewalk across the street. If any of you guys are interested, I got a lot better video on the website showing a crack repair on cast aluminum, where I use actual dye penetrant and check where the crack is, grind it out and weld it all back up. Thanks for watching. If you have any more questions or comments, leave them below. Thanks.